Lord, I ask that you bless these words, these words of this day, so they might become the spiritual food you would have for us. It's in your son's name we ask. Amen. I was kidding the 8.30 service that as I was watching games yesterday and it was raining in various parts of the world and especially the game last night it began around 8.30 and all the rain and I thought, you know, maybe they have something that we don't have in the church. You know, think if we could get it to rain in here, we'd have 80,000 people to come and uh, maybe if we did the smoke and you know, and sang 2001 and, or played 2001 and Jonathan and I ran down the hill, uh, you know, we might get, uh, uh, get people enthused and excited about worship and those kinds of things. I don't think so. I was just playing. Um, but I appreciate you being here. Um, and uh, I'd be safe going home if you see water in the road, go, go around it, go in another direction. Do not try to go through it. A lot of people have done that and uh, some have been hurt and they've lost their cars and some have lost their lives trying to do that, so be careful. Now you've heard me say it before, but I feel compelled to say it again. Uh, I became a lectionary preacher many, many, many years ago because I felt that uh, the entire Bible should be uh, open to me and to, to preach. And I shouldn't stick or go to those hot topics you know, or, or the hot word, uh, you know, those things that are cozy and warm and, and give you the, the, the goosebump feelings. But the entire Bible, even those that are uncomfortable, those who feel horrid, uh, those who um, may, well, may even offend, now, I went to the lectionary cycle because over a three-year period, you get a really good mix of biblical theology. Uh, if you will, you get the, a well-rounded theological food group to dine upon. Now, every now and then in the lectionary reading, uh, something comes across that parts of me, I have to confess, that I really would rather avoid. I'd rather go, I'd rather go somewhere else. I'd, I'd want to go to the Psalms or to an epistle reading. And, and I read this text, that two weeks ago I read this text, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, you know, that's awful for World Communion Sunday to have a text like this in front of us. Then I, I remember the commitment and I prayed about it, and I thought about it, and, and then a little somewhere between Union and uh, Myrtle Beach, uh, the Holy kind of whispered in my ear, what better text is there than this on World Communion Sunday? Because you see, the text itself is about human brokenness. It's about brokenness. God never intended any of this. God didn't intend for his children there in the Garden of Eden to rebel. But that's what free will brought. He loved us so much, he wanted the love to come from us, from our will to love him, not something he imposed upon us. But by giving us that free will to love, he gave us the free will to abandon, the free will to turn our back on God's love. The free will, if you will, to divorce God. To divorce God. To say no to the holy. To reject him. To walk away. To deny our relationship. There's a story about a man, two men talking to one another. Uh, one was very young, one was Tom's age, and uh, the young man was telling the older gentleman that he was about to get married. And the older gentleman listened to him very politely, and the young man was talking about 
all the things that were going to happen and where they were going to go on their honeymoon and blah, blah, blah. And the young man just suddenly realized this older gentleman had never been married. And the young man said, oh, I'm sorry. Have you ever thought about being married? He said, yeah, I thought about it all the time. And he said, well, why didn't you get married? He said, well, I was looking for the uh, perfect woman. And, he, and the young man said, well, you never found the perfect woman? He said, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. But when I went to talk to her, I found out she was looking for the perfect man. I tell that story because in reality, there are no perfect people. There's no perfect wife. There's no perfect husband. There's no perfect child. No perfect grandparent. There's no perfect church member. And I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, there's no perfect preachers either. Just ask my wife. And the sooner we come to grips with that imperfection, the sooner we come to grips that we all are human, the sooner we come to grips that we are all broken children, the sooner we mature, the sooner the maturation, spiritual maturation in our life takes place. We grow up. We go from the pablum, uh, the cereal that we eat as spiritual infants, to what Paul calls the meat. We begin to dine on the real stuff. And those Pharisees that came to Jesus that day were coming not because they wanted some theological question answered. They came to trick Jesus. They wanted him to say something that would cause Herod to get angry with him, just like John said something that caused Herod to get angry enough to have his head chopped off. And they thought if they could get Jesus tricked into some misstatement, the head of Jesus would be on a platter just like John's was. So they come asking their question. And Jesus says, well, what did uh, Moses command of you? Let's see, Jesus responds with a trick answer there, with a trick question answer. See, Moses never commanded them to do anything. He gave allowance, but he never commanded. And they say, well, gee, uh, Moses uh, said that uh, he, he gave decree of divorce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Jesus never affirms that or denies that. The way Jesus moves through that is he, he accepts it all as human brokenness. But when you really see his answer is when those children are coming to him and the disciples get angry and the disciples want to push these children away, Jesus says, no, let them come to me. You see, he's healing the brokenness. Children were worthless. Ch children were expendable. Children didn't mean anything in that society. But for Jesus, Jesus is going to heal that brokenness. And isn't that the life of Jesus anyway? Where he saw the division between man and woman, he tried to stitch that relationship together. Where he saw the division, economics, he tried to heal that division by showing to those who could the need for gratitude for those who had less. For those who were shut out, shunned out, pushed out, put down, cast away, put away. You see, Jesus, through his ministry, always bringing them back to a stable position, to a place of equality in spirit, in mercy, in grace. No, God never intended divorce. But God never intended any of the other commandments, all the Ten Commandments, which divorce is not part of the Ten Commandments. That's, that's part of the issue there too. It talks about number seven, adultery. And in number ten, it talks about covet. But it doesn't talk about divorce in the Ten Commandments. Those are rabbinical things. Those were things that were done by the rabbis. 
No, Jesus is all about healing because it's in the sin that we become broken. It's in the sinning that causes separation. It's in the sinning that causes alienation. Whether it be towards our spouse or toward God himself. Over 2,000 years ago, the father of the garden walked in the Son of Man. And that son preached, taught, healed, and made friends with those broken by culture and society, religion, and by sin. Where the community was torn apart by human sin, he built a bridge between those insiders and those outsiders between the rich and the poor, between man and woman. And where he found life torn apart, he sewed it back together with a thread of grace and the thread of mercy. Finally, when human brokenness seemed to be lost in that titanic struggle between life and death and darkness and light of evil and good, he gave his life on that insignificant hill in, the country, a hill in the countryside of Galilee upon the wood of a cross. Amen. Ultimate healing for all the brokenness of humanity. So today we gather at this table and we remember that which God has brought together. We remember that which we have broken apart and that which needs to be united and healed and made whole again. It is here at this table we remember what was done for us. It is here at this table where we become broke, where we were broken by sin and we're made whole again by grace. So let us come to the table this morning with Christians all over the world under different flags, speaking from different tongues of different nationalities and cultures and, uh, and celebrate this meal together spiritually. There are so many things, so many things that separate us. But this meal reminds us we hold something in common with one another, with the world over, with all of humanity. Every last one of us. Every last one of us is damaged goods. We're all damaged goods. And it's only by the grace of God that we're made whole. Amen.